This is the story of Mitchell Page, one Marine who made a difference. The journey that took Mitchell Page to the beaches of Guadalcanal began on the banks of a river near Pittsburgh. Well, my mother was probably the most patriotic person you ever met in your lifetime. And my father is a railroad worker. Uh, after I was born in Charleroi, my parents moved to a little town called Camden Hill in Mifflin Township. My mother's favorite thing was every Armistice Day, we'd stand on the sidewalk, and when the Marines came by, they were so sharp, and they had blue pants on with a red stripe. And I yanked my mother's hand, you know, it was the first time she'd taken me, I was about six and a half or seven years old, and I told my mom, I said, I'd sure like to be one of those guys someday. I have a, the blue pants and that red stripe. She was probably my greatest ins inspiration. And uh, uh, I guess she instilled in me that love of God, number one flag and country, and Boy Scouting. That's exactly what she was trying to tell me. As you know, on my honor, I'll do my best to, to do my duty to God and my country. And she was more or less telling me the same thing that I'd already learned in Boy Scouts. As a Boy Scout, he completed all the requirements for Eagle Scout. But he joined the Marines and reported for duty before he actually received his Eagle Scout rank. When I left home to join the Marines, on my birthday, I joined on my birthday. I was at a recruiting office when I was still 17. The next day I became 18, but I was sworn in in the Marine Corps. And she baked a cake, one of those little flat cakes with icing on it, and, and cut it up so I could eat pieces of it while I started my 200-mile walk to Baltimore, Maryland, which was the nearest Marine Corps recruiting office. Her parting words to me were, with tears rolling down her cheeks, I can still see her in here. She said, son, all I want you to do is trust in God. Don't try to figure out everything by yourself, and God will show you the way. After boot camp at Paris Island, Mitchell Page was posted throughout the world, including duty in China in 1938. The United States Navy had two transports in those days, in the 20s and 30s. One was a Shawmont and the other one was a Henderson. I boarded that. We went to Hawaii, stopped at Guam on our way to Cavite, Philippine Islands, to the naval station. It was guard duty guarding the American naval station. I played baseball in the Marine team and eventually made the Asiatic Fleet baseball team and played all over the Philippines and just uh, Army at the Corregidor and different things. But we must remember at that time the total strength of the Marine Corps was 17,000 men. That included the two-star general in Washington, D.C. So I'm trying to give you a little brief history of what happened and uh, what, the, what it was like in those days. And uh, actually the private made $21 a month, but he, uh, his take-home pay was $20.80 a month because the Navy took 20 cents away from me for hospitalization. So when I had my pen appendectomy in the Philippines, it cost me 20 cents. On the 10th of, I think it was the 12th of December, 1937, we received word that the uh, Japanese had sunk one of our gunboats in the Yangtze River, the Pan A. And uh, that developed into quite of, uh, uh, an event for all the Marines in the, in the whole Far East, because uh, uh, the Chinese and the Japanese were fighting. They started that year also, 1937, and then to the American Embassy in Peking, China. Altogether, I was out to between the three of them, 1938, 39, and 1940. And one of the exciting things that happened when I was stationed out there, I was in charge of the train guard as a private first class, making $29.80 a month. I would pick up all the supplies at uh, Taku Bar, on the Mukden Peking Railroad, and uh, they would load the boxcar, and then I would get inside the boxcar armed with a 45 only, had padlock it, and then uh, I would ride in that boxcar all the way to Tintin and arrest at Peking. A master sergeant or a gunnery sergeant or somebody would unlock the, the boxcar that I was in and let me out. This was quite a job, uh, delivering supplies to the American Embassy to the Horse Marines in Peking and to uh, a Marine detachment at uh, Tinsin. And while at Tinsin, uh, one day we got up and we were barricaded in. We had barbed wire around our barracks. And uh, at that time, we were told that General Homa had 150,000 Japanese in the Tinsin area. 
and we had 125 Marines at uh, Tinsin. They had uh, just a little more in uh, uh, Peking because it was the American Embassy Guard. They're, naturally, their strength would be a little higher. When they put the barbed wire up, I wrote to my parents, uh, and I told them I was sure that we'd be at war with Japan within two or three years when they put that barbed wire barricade up because uh, actually some of our room boys come, trying to get into the barracks were, were electrocuted as they came in. Well, that was just one of the things that happened. So in late 1940, I came, I was sent home, and uh, after 30-day leave, I went to Quantico, Virginia again, back to uh, H Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines. And all the time I was in Tencent in Peking, I was attached to a dog, co dog company, a machine gun uh, company. So I was primarily with machine guns for years and years. From uh, Quantico to uh, Cuba again, and through Puerto Rico and a number of other places. And uh, we made uh, our headquarters at uh, Guantanamo Bay. And so uh, it, it was at this place that... Uh, we formed the 1st Marine Division. It was formed on the 1st of February, 1941. Right after that, uh, our Marines moved from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, to Paris Island for a couple of weeks. And then we were sent to North Carolina to the swamps and, and uh, woods of a little town called New River. Today, it is Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. The maneuver is there constantly. And meanwhile, we were still working on machine guns. However, while I was in Cuba, the captain, Captain Michael McGinnis Mahoney, my company commander, uh, was anxious to uh, change the machine guns to improve them considerably in the accuracy and firing. So uh, they moved all, uh, all of our eight machine guns into my tent. So I slept with eight machine guns in my tent in Cuba. And uh, we drilled holes through the bolts of the of the machine guns. We changed the driving spring. We took the back plate across, out, and we kept improving the gun to a point where we had it firing. Instead of 555 50 rounds a minute, we had it build up to 1,300 rounds a minute, 1,300 bullets a minute flying out of the machine gun. And it paid off for long-distance targets because uh, one mill, which was just... Uh, a very fraction of uh, of an inch, one inch would move you three feet at every thousand at uh, every thousand yards. So we knew that uh, most of the machine guns, when they were firing 550 rounds, had uh, at least three, four, five mils. So that would mean the bullet, one bullet would be here, and the next one might be 15 feet higher. So we knew nobody in the world was 15 feet tall. So that's why we wanted. Uh, change the guns to a point where they would uh, fire so fast that it wouldn't vibrate. Well, anyhow, that was that was an in interesting place. In every instance, Marines had to carry a Springfield rifle, walk post, every day, four hours on and then eight off. So this was uh, seven days a week. Uh, and then it ended up in Apia, British Samoa. It was a beautiful, beautiful island, beautiful uh, uh, island of Apollo. The natives were uh, po uh, Polynesians, very attractive people, and we didn't know where the Japanese were going to land next. They'd already captured the Philippines, they'd captured Malaysia, and they were on their way across the Pacific, and uh, they thought they might be landing in British Samoa. So they put uh, part of our uh, the 7th Regiment of the 1st Marines, and uh, each unit was sent out to a village somewhere, and I was sent to a place called Vimosa, and uh, I immediately put up my machine guns and scouted the area and, and got acquainted with the chief of the village. And, and uh, we had a wonderful rapport between all of us. And, and while uh, scouting the island to see what uh, the possibilities were for an invasion, I went to the top of the hill, Bahia, and I found uh, a, a monument or a grave a flat on the ground this is, uh, where Robert... Louis Stevenson is buried. Every day we had gun drill, machine gun drill. We got to a point where every man in my platoon, that was one of the requirements that I demanded, that the man be able to field strip three weapons, um, the Browning uh, water-cooled machine gun, 1917-1918-A1, uh, the Springfield rifle, 1903, uh, five-round bolt-action rifle, and the 1911 uh, pistol, cold pistol. 
they got to the point where, when while we were at uh, British Samoa, that the, every man in my platoon could field strip uh, all three weapons, take them all apart with all the nuts and bolts and everything else, put them on a blanket, and take it apart and put it together blindfolded. So I thought when we go to combat, I knew my men would know their weapon well, and uh, they'd know exactly how to use it. And uh, every night, uh, they would have me tell stories about China and the Philippines. And uh, you have to remember, I've had these kids since Cuba, uh, 1940, so right out of boot camp. So I had to, I had the wonderful opportunity of training them myself. I was a platoon sergeant when we went to Guadalcanal, before we went to Guadalcanal. So uh, I'm directing most of my remarks to the platoon sergeants of the Marine Corps. That's one of the most important jobs that anybody can have in the Marine Corps because you you are running a, uh, a group of men and uh, you're charged with the responsibility of making sure that if they go to combat that they're prepared to fight and win. Not only that, I felt that everybody should be cognizant and knowledgeable of what's going on in the rest of the world. So I was always reading and getting information uh, from the, the Navy or uh, any of the ships or anybody that uh, left anything, even the British, uh, their weekly paper. And uh, I would share a lot of things with the men to where I had lieutenants coming over from other organizations to listen to some of my sea stories at night. And uh, I used to tell them, tell the men that... Uh, one of the things that I learned by reading all the time, and I encouraged everybody to read everything and anything that they could find. And I used to tell them about uh, all the French general, um, Foch, rather, in World War I, who told his troops before they were engaged in, in the battle with the Germans in World War I, he said, there, was, there is no studying on the battlefield. And I really emphasized that to every man in my platoon that uh, you don't have time to break out a manual and start studying once you get into battle. But I prefer to learn from experience. Now, I learned that by reading about uh, uh, statesman, president of Germany, Otto von Bismarck, and uh, literally had hundreds of these little uh, quotes. And I used that effectively in my lectures to my troops because I wanted them to know everything that they possibly would run into because I wanted them all to stay alive and win a war wherever we went. He was on duty on Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941. I was in my tent. I had a little little box uh, radio. And they said, uh, <clears throat> we interrupt this program to bring you this information. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The captain came running in the tent. He says, you got all your machine guns ready? I said, yes, sir. Well, we'll be the first ones to leave. And we were. The Japanese were just taking over the whole Pacific theater. They'd wiped out the Philippines, they'd wiped out Singapore. They were just uh, overrunning all the bases everywhere, you know, Guam. We knew we were going into combat. We were put on a liberty ship, my platoon. We had the real veterans. We had the old timers. Even our officers were World War I officers. So we had the cream of the crop, in other words. In the early months of 1942, the Japanese offensive rolled through the Pacific. A major objective was to cut the supply lines to Australia and New Zealand by building an airfield in the Solomon Islands. That airfield was on Guadalcanal. We went out dark on the 24th and uh, we headed west. We passed our, our line. We went into Japanese territory and uh, they said that I would have, uh, Major Conley said that there's a hill to your left front. I want you to take go up there and take that hill. The battle for Henderson Field was coming to a head. The Japanese Sendai Division was in position for an all-out attack. Platoon Sergeant Page received his orders to hold his position at all costs. They claimed that if the Japanese had held um, 
uh, Henderson Field in Guadalcanal that they would absolutely have taken Australia and New Zealand. I crawled up there on my hands and knees and artillery was coming in. It was landing all around us. The Japanese were, knew where we were. So that night, uh, when we were lying there on the ground, I could literally smell a Japanese. I could. I could smell them. I, uh, they musty. They're like uh, old gunny sacks full of something. They're wet. And that's exactly where they smell. And pretty soon, about an hour or two after we'd gotten into position, I set up the guns. In my own mind, I decided that, look, I'm charged with the responsibility of putting this outfit through successful battle, because Conley says, I'm depending on you, Mitch. I'm going to be down the hill behind you with 18 men in my CP, my command post. And he says, I want you to hold that. He says, because I have a feeling they're going to hit right on your position. So I silently went to, crawled around and told the machine gunners, I says, I'm going to, when you hear my pin, I'm going to pull a pin on the hand grenade. And when you hear that, I'm going to lob it right in front of us over the hill. I give it a good pitch because I don't know exactly where they are. And by golly, they don't know how close the Japanese were. Uh, I had the ideal position. But the only thing is, I didn't have enough men. But uh, God made it possible that my 33 men could hold off 2,500 and 3,000 Japanese. They had uh, units that had probably five or six years of extensive fighting in Mongolia and China. And uh, some of these guys were huge. Um, some of that were lying around my machine guns uh, were six-footers, 200-pounders. And I remember vividly just being from here to you when uh, a huge Japanese ran a bayonet through uh, uh, little Leaphart, who was the smallest man in my platoon, and ran a bayonet through him and literally threw him over his head backwards. It was the most fierce, wildest, uh, you hear nothing but screeching, dying men, losing one of my men had his head blown off. And uh, uh, they just wounded, when the man is wounded and you hear nothing but screaming, Japanese are hollering. It's one Jap charging my line, my line. I heard him just as distinct, uh, just as though he was standing in this room here right now with me. And he says, blood for the emperor, blood for the emperor. And I guess he was waving his sword. I couldn't see him, it was pitchy dark, but I could hear him. And somebody had blasted it away at him with a machine gun. But uh, Stansbury, he gets up and he hollers, blood for Eleanor, blood for Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt. And all my guns opened up and they were right on top of us. They had, all you could see was fixed, in the flashes, was fixed bayonets. They were screaming, hollering, you ever heard in your lifetime. I wouldn't even try to explain it to anybody. At daylight, uh, I'd swung one of my guns around, incidentally, and I just fired 250 rounds, just like this. <laughs> right on where I thought these guys were. And I knew these guys were just laying there, getting their weapons ready to fix bandits and everything and charge over the hill. Here I am loading a machine gun. I'm sitting on the ground. I pick up a belt underneath the machine gun. I lift the cover of the machine gun, clamp it in there, locks it in the belt holding pole, holds it. Now I've got to come back again and go forward to pull the bolt back the second time so that it drops the bullet down, first bullet, down into the into the barrel itself. And then the rest of them, the 249 bullets, will, as long as I have my finger on a trigger, they'll all go off. Well, when I was in that backward position, I couldn't go forward. I was straining, straining as hard as I could. I couldn't go forward. And I thought, oh Lord, I said, Lord, I gotta go forward, I gotta go forward. And all of a sudden, I just decided that I felt like I was sitting in a park and I just relaxed. I felt a warmth between my chin and my Adam's apple. And this machine gunner over here, I swear, this guy emptied his machine gun at me. I knew it was about 30 rounds because he had a banana-shaped clip on it, and I knew all the Japanese weapons. And he had fired at me, and the bullets were coming like this, and some underneath my chin and my Adam's apple, because I could feel a warmth as you know, they went by. It didn't touch me. It didn't give me a scratch. And all of a sudden, I flew over the gun, you know, just like that. And uh, I had it loaded, I spun it around, fired one burst at him, and he was gone. God prevented me from turning that machine gun around first. Because had I turned that machine gun around, he would have had me this way, from shoulder to shoulder, you see, that close. 
it wouldn't matter any difference if he went left or right, it hit me. So when I uh, charged down the hill, I was bouncing and I'm running right at this, at this, uh, uh, I guess he was a colonel, maybe he was a brigadier general, I don't know, but anyhow, he's a high ranking officer. And uh, the, the crazy Japanese got up and I don't know whether they're blind or what, out of the kunai grass, and they were standing there like this, and I'm coming down and I just swiveled over like I did to the back, and they just lay down in the dead in the uh, kunai grass. So I kept on running toward the officer, and he was firing at me, about this time he had his pistol in his hand, and he was firing at me, and as I said, he hit my helmet twice, and that's the way my bullets hit him. Mitchell Page and his Marines held their line against overwhelming enemy attacks. I just felt that, well, uh, there's no more noise around here. I don't see any live Japanese. As far as I'm concerned, the battle's over. That's just the way I felt. I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for my mother's prayers. And you've got to have the feeling that you can trust, trust the man on your right and the man on your left. No matter what happens, he's going to be there to fight with you and die with you if necessary. He attributes a lot of what he learned to the Boy Scouts. Scouting put me through battles. Believe your oath and your law in anything you do. Anything, because the words are there. Receiving his Eagle Scout rank means a lot to him. God knows that I, I was using the oath. I was using everything I knew about scouting. Uh, camping, building fires, everything I did, I'd done in these merit badges, you know. So uh, it just came and the uh, Lord let me use it and protected me with it. Colonel, simplify. Colonel Page, sir, we salute you. Colonel Page, hurrah, sir! Colonel, we'll carry on. <laughs>